Hey everybody, thank you for once again checking in. I've tested lots and lots of digital cameras for this channel, mostly mirrorless, there was one SLR, but I've never picked a favorite. So that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna set myself the task of picking my favorite digital camera. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. Today, I'm going to attempt the task of choosing my favorite digital camera that I've shot for this channel. And that's gonna be quite a short list, I think, because I have only shot two micro four thirds cameras. One's the Panasonic GH2 that I bought around about 2010, something like that. and. Uh, I've shot lots of images with it and more importantly done lots of video with because it's a really good video camera. And then there's the Olympus EM10 Mark I that I bought for this channel, shot for a while, was very impressed with it and very upset when it conked out and refused to do anything further for me. But at least I, get, I got to shoot it for the channel. All right, so of those two, well, the GH2, I've had that camera for many, many years, and it's a lovely little camera. It came with a kit zoom. I've never really had any wish to change that. It seems to work perfectly well for what I need it to do. I have used it with some vintage lenses, but not very many. I've not used it much with vintage lenses because, sadly, the GH2 doesn't have focus peaking. The only focusing aid it has is magnification, which personally I find a bit of a faff to use. I'd rather have the peaking there when you turn the control so that you can see what you're doing in, you know, there and then without having to push any further buttons. The GH2 makes very, very nice video. Even today, you can use a GH2 for video, and if it's not too demanding an application, YouTube, for example, no one's gonna know the difference. I mean, there are, there are cameras that are turned out now, mirrorless cameras that are sold, made and sold now, that can't do video as nice as the GH2. Did it and you can hack it to do even better video you can make that into a pro video camera if you want to and i know a lot of people actually did that however it's got one big drawback well it's got one drawback in the form of focus peaking which i've already talked about and it's got a big drawback in the form of its color performance i never liked its color performance it'll do reasonable colors but they're always overcast with a sort of a muddy green, greeny, yellowy, just splodge. Like, like someone's just got a bucket of greeny, yellowy splodge and just thrown it all over. I'm sorry to GH2, any GH2 users out there who love their cameras. I too love my GH2. I just don't think it does colours that are really anything like the rest of the industry does. I don't think Panasonic ever quite got there on colours for stills. And I believe, this is hearsay because I've not actually experienced it for myself, but I've read that that is still the same today. Panasonic colours, certainly through the iterations of the GH cameras, never really got very much better, I don't know. The Olympus camera that I use, the EM10 Mark I, well, that has focus peaking, uh, and that's really important if you want to use a camera with uh, vintage lenses, as I do, I use a lot of vintage lenses. Plus, not only that, it gives the most stunning colors. Some of the nicest colors in the business, actually, that little Olympus camera gives, and I'm sure all the rest of the Olympus, uh, uh, Olympus Micro Four Thirds cameras are, uh, the same, if not better, because I have heard people rave about the Olympus colours and having seen them myself, I can only agree they are fantastic. So of those two cameras, my favourite, the winner, I don't actually have it here with me at the moment, but if I did, 
imagine it upon this hand, is the Olympus EM10 Mark I. Well done, little Olympus. Well, I've shot a lot of APS-C cameras. Most of them have been Fujifilm cameras, but we'll go through them all and uh, see see which ones we like. Well, so I shot the Sony NEX7, the NEX7. Those were the predecessors to the A5000 and 6000 series that Sony make. Now I think they make the, I believe they still sell, sell the A6600 now. So the NEX7 was the top, top of the line um, in around about what, I don't know, 20, 13, 14, something like that. It's got a nice little sensor, APS-C size with 24 megapixels. Importantly, and unlike many of its brethren at the time, um, it has a viewfinder, and that's a really, really important thing, I think, with a camera. I, I mean, you can use a camera without a viewfinder. I use my phone camera all the time without a viewfinder and seem to do fine, but you can't see it too clearly in very bright weather. With a viewfinder, you are guaranteed that you're going to be able to see in bright weather. The images were nice, no complaints at all about them. Um, Sony colours are not the best in the world, I, I, I really have to say that. I mean, I've used a Sony A7 for years and years and years, and I've, I've not really got any complaints about it. It's a nice camera, but I do think the colours could be that bit better. Than, I, I certainly don't think they're up to the standards of Olympus camera uh, uh, colours or Fujifilm colours come to that. So... I mean, I don't think Sony have the best colours, but the, the NEX7 was okay. <clears throat> it didn't seem, it didn't feel terribly well made to me. It, it, I mean, it was all right, nothing fell off it, but it didn't seem quite as well made as the uh, A6000 that I bought a little later on. That was a nicer camera. It just felt like a better camera it felt better built it felt like it shot that bit better i can't remember now whether it has more megapixels or not but it's academic when you get over 16. um but again it has those sony colors and the sony colors just aren't the best but certainly of the sony aps-c cameras that i've shot I find the A6000 was the clear winner, absolutely clear winner, just because of the build quality. It had a much better build quality. It felt it when you picked it up, it felt it when you handled it, and it felt it when you actually used it as well. So APS-C Sony, the A6000, you, you really can't go wrong. But we've not finished the APS-C category yet. There's so many Fujifilm cameras to go at. My gosh, I've shot a lot of those. And in fact, I've shot so many of them, they really deserve a category of their own. But I'm not going to give them that. I'm just going to go through them um, as I use them and tell you what I think. So X-T10, available for a really bargain price. It's got the same sensor as the X-T1, which if I recall, do correct me if I'm wrong, is the X-Trans 2 sensor that's in the X-T1 camera and the X-T10. So that's my favourite uh, Fujifilm sensor. I think it's beautiful. Absolutely lovely, lovely, lovely sensor. Later sensors are nice, but in my opinion, not quite as nice. The earlier sensor, the X-Trans 1, is... Stunning, but doesn't have the um, just doesn't have the flexibility that the X Trans Two has. So the XT Ten has my favourite sensor. It's a nice camera. It makes beautiful images. It's a sort of a cut down XT One, so it doesn't have quite as many dials on the top. But it's none the worse for that, and you can buy these cameras now quite cheaply. I bought mine a couple of years ago for £175. 
I don't know what one would cost now, but I can't see it being too much more than that. And the X-T10 makes images that are as nice as those images that come from the X-T1. So why buy an X-T1? Well, you do get that little extra dial on top, which apart from giving you another extra dial on top, which is great to look at, is actually very functional as well. You need those uh, you, you you need that dial on the top. It gives you that extra functionality and, um, you know, it means that you don't have to dive into menus to find that setting. So that is a really good thing. Plus, the proportion is nicer as well. If you like, if if the if the appearance of your cameras is, is important, as it is to me, that's part of the experience. The appearance of the camera well then the xt1 beats the xt10 because its lines are nicer the xt10 is slightly less wide the xt1 has just that little bit more width that makes the lines flow better and the camera feel better in the hand the x pro one i used some time ago well now that is an extraordinary thing designed to reproduce the feel as far as is possible of using an old rangefinder, an old film rangefinder. And it's even got a choice between an optical viewfinder and an EVF, an electronic viewfinder. Well, now I use vintage lenses a lot. So the optical viewfinder, there's no focusing aid in it. So you've got to use, if you're using an X-Pro one, you've got to use autofocus lenses otherwise you don't know where you're focused on what you're focused on anything so use the evf i found myself using the evf so much and so often that i in the end i just stuck with it because i was really using mostly vintage lenses on it anyway now the x pro one has a gorgeous sensor it's the X Trans One, I think. Do correct me if I'm wrong. It's gorgeous. It produces the most creamy, smooth, beautiful. It looks like they've got a sheen of ivory over them or something. You know, a couple of molecules thin of ivory. It's just, just extraordinary images that sensor produces, but it's not very flexible. It doesn't have many film sims built in. Um, and there aren't that many film sim, sims you can cook on it either by, um, you know, there's uh, Richie Roche's website is a good example of uh, sims you can cook for the Fuji cameras, though there are others. He doesn't have, he has hardly any cookable options on there for the X-Pro one. So the X-Trans one sensor, that's a minus point against it in my view, even though it gives such beautiful images. The X-E1. Now that's an interesting camera because it's a kind of a cut down X-Pro one. It's, it's a smaller camera. It feels nicer in the hand, to me at least anyway. It doesn't have the fancy choice between the EVF and the optical viewfinder, but personally, I mean, what do you want that for anyway? But I know people do want that. I'm not, I'm not, you know, forgive me. I don't. Uh, if 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 you if you use your optical viewfinder a lot, personally for me, I don't find it's any use because I use a lot of vintage lenses. So the XE one, very very nice. Uh, it's got that EVF. One thing I should say about the XE one, it's a cut down X Pro one. It has that same sensor, but, and this is a criticism I share with the X-Pro one as well. The only focus peaking color, if you want to do focus peaking with the old vintage lenses, the only peaking color is white and it doesn't really show up terribly clearly. You can't you have red peaking, yellow peaking, blue peaking. All you've got is white on both the X-Pro one and the XE one definitely a mark against them. So the XC1 is a cut down X Pro one, which actually I prefer. I think the X Pro one's got a lot of bells and whistles on it that for me, I just don't need. 
So I was much happier with the XC1. However, I was even happier when I found that there's an XE2. Now that's got the same sensor as, not as the X Pro one, but as the XT1 and as the XT10, which if you're paying attention, which I hope you are at the back of the class, you'll remember is my favorite Fujifilm sensor. So the XE2 is really a camera with everything. It's got that small form factor. It's not an SLR form factor. It's a sort of a point and shooty range finder E form factor. It really is very small, about the size of an Olympus Trip 35. And it's got that beautiful sensor and it's got lots of different peaking colors. Now that is really important to me. So, that is a camera that I really like, actually, the X-E2. Where do we go next? Right, X-T2. Okay, I did have an X-T1 and I loved it, but I sold it to buy an X-T2. Why did I do that? Well, I bought, I did that because the X-T2 had better video and I did want a camera that did better video at the time I was shooting my YouTube videos on uh, mirrorless SLRs. And I wanted one that would do it and that would do it nicely. So I got the X-T2. Now, I shot a lot of video uh, videos with that camera, but that aside, the stills were beautiful. Absolutely delicious, beautiful, lovely, lovely, lovely stills from the, again, correct me if I'm wrong, X-Trans 3 sensor, I think. But not as nice as the X-Trans 2 in the X-E2, the X-T1 and the X-T10. I didn't think anyway. More megapixels for sure, 22 I think, as against 16 in the X-T1. The X-T2 has 22 megapixels, it might be a bit more, 20 something anyway. Shot some beautiful, beautiful stills with it, but I never thought it was quite as nice. Never thought it was quite the same or as beautiful as the shots from that X-T1 sensor. Well, now, the X-T2 only did video of 15 minutes and I wanted something that would do video for a bit longer. So I bought an X-T3, sold the X-T2, bought an X-T3 that will do video for 30 minutes. And I shot some of my episodes on that. That's irrelevant though. What are the stills like? I'll tell you what the stills are like. The stills are beautiful, absolutely beautiful, stunning Fujifilm stills. Nobody, but nobody in the business does colors like Fujifilm, but they were still, in my opinion at least, not quite as nice as the images from that X-T1, the X-Trans 2 sensor. So the X-T3 has an X-Trans 4, I think, sensor. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not quite as nice. I don't find the images personally quite as nice as those from the X-T1. Video is nice enough. If you want a camera for video, I really wouldn't buy one of the Fujifilm mirrorless. It's nice enough, but I don't think it's their strongest suit. You might find that the video dedicated Fujifilm camera is better. In fact, I'm sure you would. But the SLRs, uh, DSLRs rather, that I've shot video with the X-T2 and the X-T3, honestly, I think they've fallen a bit short. Not in terms of colours and all of that, but in terms of flexibility of use as a video camera, design and thought as a video camera. It, it's, I don't think that it's the best option. Anyway, I also shot an X100V. That's the little camera, it's a beautiful little thing. It's uh, essentially a point and shoot. It's a fixed 23 millimeter, I think, lens. I shot that camera, I've got to say, I really wasn't enamoured with it. I didn't like the exposure restrictions that are on it. 
Um, there's a thing now. What is it now? Well, I remember. Let me have a thing. That's right. It's 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 part of the Fujifilm philosophy to attempt to reproduce the experience of using a film camera. And what it was was when you're shooting manual, you um, you essentially have to keep the aperture very small because uh, the camera won't go over a certain eye. So you get overexposure if you're in manual and you keep the aperture open. The camera won't compensate. And I found that quite annoying. Um, and I also found, what else did I found? I've, I've, I found that the camera wasn't that quick to focus. Sometimes it would miss focus. And all in all, I just, I just much prefer a Fujifilm mirrorless that has interchangeable lenses that I can shoot modern lenses on if I want, or I can shoot vintage lenses on if I want. I know a lot of people love their X100 cameras, and I know I'm very much an outlier in that department. So this is a very, very, these are very, very popular cameras, and uh, you know, who am I to say? All I can give is my personal opinion. I didn't terribly well get on with it. And to be honest, I didn't much like it. So I guess that brings us on to the full framers, the mighty big sensor cameras that reproduce the same size of image that you get on a piece of film. You know, when you look at a negative, you might have, might have looked at a strip of negatives. Well, each Full frame sensor is the size of one of those images on a negative. So that's a pretty whacking big sensor. And it's a great kind of sensor to test or to use and shoot vintage lenses on if that's what you're into. And I'm guessing if you're watching this channel, you might just be into that for at least part of the time. So I've only actually shot two full frame cameras and one of them you will probably know quite well. It's this one here. This is my Sony A7. And this is a tiny little full frame camera. It really is small. This is smaller than most Fujifilm cameras. And I'll just show you that sensor there. There it is. There's the sensor. And that's a mighty big sensor for a camera to have and it really was a technical tour de force at the time it's fairly commonplace now but at the time although Leica had done it a year or so previously uh, in a consumer camera this was really quite a tour de force well now I love this camera this this is a fantastic little camera and it really is small I don't have any other cameras here to compare it with at the moment apart from this Polaroid that I've got in the background and it's certainly <laughs> certainly is smaller than that one, but it's smaller than most of the Fujifilm cameras and it really is a great little camera to have. It's got great focus peaking on it. This is the Mark I version. and These are now available really cheaply. You can get Mark IIs, Mark IIIs, Mark IVs, and I think they're even up to Mark Vs now and, and, and they all have various little tweaks and refinements on them. I think the Mark II has... Uh, the uh, uh, sensor shift stabilization, image stabilization. Great for video, gives you a couple of more stops. Uh, also for stills, if you're shooting in low light. But they have, there's a price for that. They've got bigger and bigger over the years and they're not now as sleek and svelte as this original one was. This camera has very strong focus peaking. It's the strongest focus peaking that I've ever used. It really, really is excellent. It's far better than Fuji's. It's far better than the Olympus camera that I've used. Um, it's the best focus peaking system that I've tried. So it scores in that respect. It scores in the fact that it's small. You can shoot pretty much any lens on this camera because it's mirrorless. Um, the flange distance, that is the distance from the rear of the lens to the actual sensor, which is there. That's the actual plane of the sensor. So it's a tiny distance. So by adding distance, you can use pretty much any lens ever made on there because it's a mirrorless camera. So that 
is a real advantage. Battery life, however, is not good on these cameras. The battery is small. I'll show you the battery. That's a tiny look. That's a really, really small battery. And that's got a power, a great big sensor. And uh, in fact, it doesn't help if you switch to viewfinder because the viewfinder on this camera apparently uses more juice than the screen at the back there. Not quite sure how true that uh, or, or, or how that can be rather, or indeed how true it is, but that's what I've read and it was from an authoritative source. A very, very nice little camera, the Sony A7 and now available very cheaply. The other full frame camera I've shot was one of the original um, Canon 5D cameras and that was a really nice camera, far, far bigger than the A7, of course, because it's a DSLR, that's not a mirrorless camera, so it's bigger than the A7, but you can shoot a lot of vintage lenses on it. The flange distance on the Canon cameras is such that by adding a little length, you will find that you can shoot a lot of the old lenses on it. I know for a fact that you can shoot Olympus and M42 lenses on there, so that already gives you um, a vast, vast selection of lenses, especially the M42 bit, literally thousands and thousands, probably tens of thousands of lenses available in M42 mount. It's not a very high res camera. It's got 12 megapixels, but they are 12 of the most fantastic megapixels you'll find. It gives a lovely old school image, a beautiful soft sort of image. 12 megapixels is enough for anybody unless you're blowing up to the size of a house, which um, most of us don't do. Um, focusing is difficult on that camera if you're using vintage lenses, because of course it wasn't really made to use them. So you've got to focus either by eye, you know, look through the viewfinder and uh, try and get that image as sharp as you can just by your eyesight. You need pretty good eyesight to be able to do that. Or I believe that you can buy a focusing screen that will fit straight in there, that will go into the innards of the 5D uh, and it's got a split prism on it, just like um, in the old SLR cameras. So that would be a very worthy investment. So a really nice camera. You can shoot vintage lenses on it if you get a split prism screen or if you've got really good eyesight. Uh, lots of the old lenses will fit. It's only 12 megapixels, but they're really, really nice images and 12 megs is enough for anybody. And the 5D Classic, as it's now called, is really, really cheap. I bought mine for, again, 175. That was about three years ago, two, three years ago. I don't know how much they are now, but they're not gonna be that much different. I wouldn't have thought. Okay, so it's time to announce the winners. Well, from the Micro Four Thirds category, as you may already have guessed, I much prefer the Olympus. EM10 Mark I over the GH2, just because it's got far, far nicer colours. The GH2 shoots better video, yes, it's true, but as a stills camera, there's absolutely no contest. The Olympus wins hands down. It's got far nicer colours and it's got focus peaking for vintage lenses. So the Olympus EM10 Mark I is my pick of the admittedly limited range of um, micro four thirds cameras that I have shot. So the APS-C cameras, well, there's a great many more of those. The winner is not one of the Sony cameras, not because they're not good cameras, but because Fuji cameras have far, far, far nicer colors. So the winner is certainly one of the Fuji cameras. And 
it's going to be one of the cameras with that X Trans 2 sensor. It's going to be either the X-T10, the X-T1 or the X-E2. And for me, for my money, for the uses I put a camera to, it's going to be the X-E2. It's got that small form factor. It's got that beautiful sensor. It's got 16 megapixels, which is enough. And it does enough film sims uh, to be able to give you a little bit of visual interest and play around cooking up some sims of your own. So my favourite APS-C camera is certainly the Fujifilm X-E2. As for my favourite full frame camera, well again there's a lesser range of those to choose from and I think I think that's going to be inevitable. It's this one, it's the Sony A7. The A7 is just far more flexible than the 5D Mark I. You can shoot lots and lots of vintage lenses on it. It's got focus peaking. It's nice and small. The battery life's a bit of a drawback, but then I always take two or three extras with me. So it's not really a problem. So certainly my favorite full frame camera is the Sony A7. But of all these cameras, can I pick a favourite? Yes, I can, and I am jolly well going to do it. What will it be? Will it be one of the Micro Four Thirds cameras? No, it won't. Will it be one of the full frame cameras? No, it won't. Will it be one of the Fujifilm APS-C cameras. Yes, it will. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say it and state it loud and proud. My favourite digital camera that I have ever shot is the Fujifilm X-E2. It is a, it's a fantastic little thing. It's got everything you need, assuming you don't want to do video, which it's not very good at. But for stills, it's got that beautiful X Trans 2 sensor. It's got an EVF. It's got three different colors for peaking. It's got a beautiful small form factor. It's just lovely. It's the nicest camera, digital camera that I've shot. And that is my favorite pick, even over my Sony A7, which is a full frame camera. I'm picking the Fujifilm XE2. That's how nice those Fujifilm cameras are. So I guess that's it from me for now. Many, many thanks to subscribers for your support. I really appreciate that. That's a heartfelt thanks from me to you. It's astonishing how many people have subscribed to this channel. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do chuck us a sub. That would be appreciated. Many, many thanks also go to patrons. Thank you for your continued support and patronage, patrons old, patrons new. Many, many thanks for that support. And that is, again, a sincere and heartfelt thank you. If you would like to support this channel yourself, if you think, oh yeah, maybe this guy's doing something that's useful and interesting, and I've seen a few of his shows and I kind of like them, then you may want to help support this channel yourself. And you can do that over at patreon.com forward slash xenography. And you can do that for as little as one of your Earth dollars per month. And if you're not doing anything too strenuous or demanding next week at this time, you might want to tune in for a little more of that stuff that we call xenography. But for now, I'm going to bid you a fond farewell. And until next time, I'm going to say cheerio all. Thanks for watching. See you soon.